Oh, I really am so excited to teach for Nerit. It holds a, a special place in my heart. Um, so a few years ago, I had to go register our um, son's birth in Town Hall. He was born in Camden. So I was on my way to Judd Street and Judd Street is right in the congestion zone. So, and Town Hall is two buildings in. So I'm Jewish and there's no way I'm paying the congestion fee for 10 feet. So I decided I would find parking on the other side of Marlebone Street right before the congestion zone. So for those that know that area, I'm now driving behind the British Library and behind the British Library is a big council estate. Apparently this area has significantly been improved in the last few years, but let me tell you, it was not improved then. <laughs> um, so I'm driving around looking for parking. Uh, it was about 10 a.m. and there are drunken, drunken men sleeping in doorways, women of the night walking home, broken bottles all over the place. It's not pretty. So when I finally find a space, I literally emptied my car. Um, I'm the kind of person that lives in their car. You know, some people, their car always looks like they just bought it and you get in and they apologize that they have to move over a box of tissues. This is not me. Extra snacks, some of yesterday's snacks, bags of clothes to return to Brent Cross, the post that I grabbed on my way out the door, even though I don't really need it in the car, PE kits, football cleats they pulled off in the car, library books. Okay, you, you get the picture, right? All of this gets shoved in the basket under the baby's buggy. Of course I have the baby, he needs to make an appearance in, in City Hall. So I shove it all in and I lock the car three times and I start walking and I realize I don't know where I am. I had driven around so many times that I lost my sense of direction and there are quite wide um, buildings all around. So I can't really see. And I'm walking around garbage and a gang of boys who probably should have been in school and they're yelling. And I force myself not to stop because I can't show anyone that I'm lost. Just keep going, I tell myself. Look confident. And I pray, Hashem, please help me get out of here. My baby, my kids. And almost immediately, there's a voice. At the end of the road, turn left. I looked up, hello. <laughs> oh my God. So in case you're wondering, God sounds like Google Maps. <laughs> the voice of my GPS that I had also stuffed under the buggy without turning it off. So God answered my prayer and gave me exact directions to quickly get to town hall. But God doesn't usually send us, you know, play by play directions in life. Um, although we sometimes wish he would. Uh, real life is meaningful because it's made up of our decisions and our decisions. So our decisions are made with the tools that we are given. Firstly, the circumstances we were born into, our parents, siblings, family, neighbors, diamond history, right? Decisions in the 21st century are obviously different than if we were born 200 years ago. Um, our socioeconomic status, wealthy circumstances lead to very different decisions than for a poorer person, right? Secondly, there's the innate tools we were given, our personalities, our strengths, our weaknesses. A person with a forceful personality responds to situations completely differently than an even keeled person. It's not right or wrong or good or bad, but it's different, right? If we're more stingy or more emotional, if we have a scientific brain or more empathetic thought process, right? And so, so first is our situation. Secondly is the innate tools. And lastly is events that happen throughout our lives. Every person has different experiences and our lives are shaped by how we respond, right? So all three of these aspects come from God. The only thing that is up to us is how we respond to each of them. What we do with what we're given, how we relate to the events and issues around us, all of our decisions. So I wanna to today look at how prayer fits into this because if what we're given is from God, the, the issue with prayer is the question, can we influence this? Can we change God's mind? And is this actually what prayer is all about? So I'm the first to admit that I'm an Amazon junkie. <laughs> I'm an Amazon junkie. If most people were not able to have their regular dose of retail therapy during lockdown, 
I got double or triple. <laughs> the delivery guys are all our friends. We're on a first name basis. You know, they ring the bell and they say, hi, it's John. You know, I think they think we're a little bit crazy. But what's so amazing about Amazon is they basically always have what you want. And you might need to pay a bit more for speed, but you'll get what you're looking for in two days. And it's often cheaper than the high street. So we're not going to debate Amazon, but but Amazon Prime and I have a perfect relationship. I put in my wish list and Amazon delivers, right? Um, it, seems, it seems like some people think that prayer should work this way. Many people believe in Amazon prayer. It's similar to Amazon Prime. <laughs> Amazon prayer ascribes to the same method with Amazon prayer, right, I put in a list of requests. And since I've been a good girl, and since I'm written in the book of life, I assume that all of these good things will come to me. I pray for a whole list of things that I want. And I'm a pretty good person. And I should get those things right. So this method works amazingly online. But with God, right, if I send God a shopping list, right, an Amazon prayer, right? Maybe I'll get some of the things I asked for. Maybe some money, usually not as much as I think I need. Some health, not always as good as what I would want it to be. A new car, though probably not the convertible I specifically asked for, right? The Amazon shopping list approach to prayer is not guaranteed at all. So people say all prayers are answered, just sometimes the answer is no, right? Amazon Prime, the answer is usually yes. Amazon Prayer, the answer is sometimes no. Now, this didn't work for me, this no as a toddler or a teenager, and it doesn't work for me now as an adult. I just can't imagine that God is sitting up there, you know, going, well, she davened well today, so this I'll give her, but mm, this I won't, right? I find this kind of prayer um, exasperating, right? Really just very, very, very frustrating. Um, and it fills me with constant worry, right? Does God, Santa, right? Does Santa think I've been good enough? So I want to share another kind of prayer, a perspective that totally changed how I pray. And honestly, it changed my life. So I know I, I now live in America and everything here is, oh my gosh, it's amazing. It's life-changing, ah. But, but this really, I think it really is, um, it really is life-changing. So what I'd like to do is look at the story of Chana. Chana is the prototype of prayer and see what we can learn. And perhaps another method of prayer, not Amazon prayer, where the answer is always yes. Okay, so, Many of the laws and customs of prayer, we learn from the way that Hannah prayed. And we learn the deepest secrets of how to pray, to know what we need and ask Hashem for it, and to make requests that are answered. So we go back approximately 3,000 years before the first Beit Mikdash, and there's a Mishkan in Shiloh where people go to um, bring thanks and pray and connect with Hashem. Um, Chana, we know, has no children. She's one of Elkanah's two wives, right? The other wife is Pina, who has many children. And we imagine this really isn't ever easy for Chana, but it is most painful when there's the yearly pilgrimage. The entire Elkanah family goes to Shiloh, um, and, and Elkanah says to Chana, isn't my love greater for you than 10 children, right? Because she's so upset that she's not sharing that she doesn't have thanks to give for, for children. And she says, no, something's missing. Your love is not enough. And one year, Hannah leaves the Thanksgiving celebration, because this happens every year, or maybe a few times a year. And she finds herself a quiet place to pray. Tears are streaming down her face, and her emotions soar. Her lips are moving and pronouncing words, but no sound comes out. And her body is in complete concentration, right? This is how we learn about tefillah. And Chana calls out to Hashem, and the Talmud fills us in to the words of Chana, prayer that came from such a deep, real place 
that it brought about a miracle. Words that, so to speak, forced Hashem to change her reality. So when we look at prayer, the most common of the Hebrew words for prayer, tefillah, right? What does that, what does that mean? So, right, so tefillah actually, let, let's look at Rav Hirsch in Chorev. And he says, hapal hitpalel, the verb hitpalel, asher mimeno nigzal Hashem tefillah, from this word tefillah, the word is derived, muvano al pi mekor hurato, it's understood by its etymology. What's the etymology of hitpalel? It means lifchon et atzmo velishpot et atzmo, to deliver an opinion about oneself and to judge oneself. Lehit palel tefillah actually means introspection, to look inside. We look into ourselves and judge ourselves. Who am I? What is my purpose? How am I using the gifts that Hashem has given me? Right? So, so, so he says, again, he says, we, we, we build an opinion about ourselves. We judge ourselves and build an opinion about ourselves. So for example, every morning we thank God for a whole list of things. Thank you Hashem for eyes that see. Thank you Hashem for legs that walk. Thank you for a mind that can process and so on and so forth, right? Hashem doesn't need our thanks. So, so why do we do this? We verbally give thanks because it teaches us the importance of appreciation to recognize our blessings, but that recognition is meant to be taken a step further. What am I going to do with what I've been given? An honest appraisal of what I've done and what I plan on doing with all of these gifts. They were given to me specifically for a reason. And so I have a responsibility of how I use them, right? So we start by saying there's three aspects that Hashem gives to us, our background, our personal abilities and various life circumstances. In introspective prayer, we don't ask to change any of these. We don't change them. Rather, we assess how are we utilizing them, right? And that's the purpose of three daily prayers. In the morning, I start, right, shachrit with a plan of how I'm going to use my gifts. We stop midday, mincha, to assess if we're on track, refocus, and we end the day with, with, uh, with Mariv looking back on our achievements. Right? We recognize that everything that we're given is for serving Hashem. And we learn this also from Chana. So if we look, if we look at, um, at Chana's, Chana's tefillah as it's um, described in the Gemara in Brachot, right? So it starts with a quote, the Gemara, and it tells us, Vatidor neder. Chana makes a vow, she swears an oath, and she calls out to Hashem and she says, Hashem, Tzva'ot, Hashem, Lord of hosts, from the word Tzva army, right? And Amar Rabbi Elazar, Rabbi Elazar teaches us, Miyom Shebara Kadosh Baruch Et Olamo, from the day that Hashem, the Holy One, blessed be, created the world, Lo haya adam shekra'ola Kadosh Baruch Hu Tzva'ot, there was no person who called him the Lord of hosts, the Lord of armies, Tzva. Ad shebata chana vekarato tzva'ot, chana was the first one She's credited with being the first person to use this term, Hashem Tzvaot, the God of armies, right? Tzva. So what, are, what does it mean to have an army? What is a Tzva, right? So I saw a beautiful idea um, from, um, the book is called Aktava Kabbalah. It's Rabbi Mecklenburg from the 19th century. And he describes what is Tzvaot, whether we're using Tzvaot Hashem, the armies of God, Tzvaot Israel, the armies of Israel. And he says, Ta'amo ma'asef ha'meuchadim ve'amechubarim yachad. It's a gathering of those who are united and connected together, bechefetz nafsham, with their soul's desire, la'amot tachat mishmeret Hashem, to stand under the watch of God, ve'la'asot klal asher yetzavei lehem, to do whatever is commanded upon them. When we describe these armies, tzava is a group of, of people or any entities that are coming together to do Hashem's will, right? To do Hashem's will. And here we see tzava, not just one, 
but two, tzvaot. There are armies of forces above in the spiritual world and an army of forces in the physical world, right? And Hannah calls out to Hashem like this when she makes her vow, she says, Hashem tzvaot, right? And what, what she's saying here is she's saying, Hashem, you are, she, she, she speaks very strongly. It's a very strong word, this tzvaot, right? This Hashem of armies, right? And, but her prayer it really comes from a place of humility. Because Chana is saying to Hashem, Hashem, you are the master of all worlds, the armies above and the armies below. Everything is you. Everything is you, she says, and she continues, right? She says, everything, what, what is she saying in these words? She's saying, everything in this world is for you. Everything I do is for you. And I need you, I, you are part of everything in the world and in my life, right? And that's how she calls out to Hashem in this way where everything I'm doing, right? Again, if we think of the brachot that we say in the morning, that he's given us eyesight, that he's given us strength, that he's allowed us to get up, right? She's saying everything there is all because you, everything gathers together in order to serve you. Um, and the Talmud in Brachot continues to describe Hannah's um, self-appraisal, so to speak. Um, and, and because she, she keeps going, she doesn't just stop there. And the Talmud describes it really very, very beautifully. This, this mitpalel, this tefillah, like, like Rav Hirsch describes from it, come, this introspection. So the Pasuk in Shmuel says, Chana spoke on her heart. And the rabbis asked, what does it mean to speak on your heart? Surely you would speak from your heart. But it, he says it means, Amar Rabbi Lazar Bishum Rabbi Yossi bin Zimra. Rabbi Lazar says the name of Rabbi Yossi bin Zimra. Al liba means al iske liba, concerning matters of her heart. What's her heart? What are the matters of her heart? Amra lefanav. Chana calls out to Hashem, Ribbono shel Ola, Master of the Universe. Kol ma she barata baisha, lo barata davar echad levatala. Everything that you created in a woman, all the organs, not a single one of them is in vain. Einaim lirot, eyes to see. Oznaim lishmoa, ears to hear. Chotem leariach, a nose to smell. Pele daber, a mouth to speak. Yadaim la'asot bahem melacha, hands to perform labor. Raglaim lehalech bahem, and feet with which to walk. Dadim lehanik bahem, and breasts with which to nurse. Dadim halalu shenatata alibi, but these breasts that you placed on my heart, because he's speaking about her heart, to what purpose did you place them? Right? Libi lama. Lo lehanik bahem, was it not in order to nurse? Ten liben vehanik bahem. Give me a son, and I will nurse with them. Right, Chana shows us what tefillah is. Hashem, you've given me eyes, ears, nose, a mouth, hands, feet with which to walk. Give me a child, right? So that my breasts can also fulfill their purpose so that they will not be created in vain. Now, I imagine, I imagine that Chana didn't just mention these limbs as a long list, the way it's described here. Chana is thinking deep, and hard. There's tefillah, introspection, my eyes to see how have I used them? And she says to herself, I've used them only for good, to see the light in people, to see what is needed, to appreciate your world. My ears, what have I done with them? I listened and empathized with my husband. I heard poor people's cry. My mouth has spoken no evil. My words have soothed family and friends. My hands and feet have rushed to do your mitzvot. Amazingly, Chana can say she has used all the gifts, every single limb she has been given completely. She judges herself and everything she has. And after a complete head to toe evaluation, Chana concludes that she has used every single gift every single opportunity, completely and absolutely, totally for its spiritual purpose. 
nothing has been wasted. <laughs> Can you imagine to be able to say and know you have maximized everything you have in life for its spiritual purpose? <laughs> it blows my mind, but, but ah, she says, ah, oh, one thing is left, right? One thing I haven't used my female reproductive organs, those I've not been able to use. So she calls out Hashem, if I've used everything that I meant, my life can be over. I have completed my purpose. I've used everything else completely. But, but if I am to live, give me a child so that I can use these parts of myself as well. These organs must also achieve their spiritual purpose. And this prayer of wanting to maximize everything for the spiritual, her prayer is answered with a child. And Chane continues her life with her son Shmuel with that same focus of godliness um, and spirituality and everything, right? So when we look at Chana's life, I think we can, we can relate to the fact that some things she prayed for she got and some she didn't. Ultimately a child, but years and years and years of almost despair, right? Challenges with Penina, upset with Elkanah. So, so what happens in her prayer? Chana says, I realize that whatever I have, the situations that I'm in, my own personal self, these are all tools to serve you. And she spends every day figuring out how to maximize all she is and all she's been given. And this is really what Hashem is doing. He's sending us opportunities for us to maximize. Now, I can't promise a specific physical outcome of prayer. <laughs> I can't promise miracles. I wish I could. Oh, how I wish I could. But I'd like to share another method um, in prayer where the response from Hashem is a resounding yes. Always yes. And it, I've learned it from Rav Dessler in his famous philosophical work, Michtav Meliyahu, Strive for Truth. Um, and he teaches us a method of prayer which is always answered in the positive. And it's a similar angle that Chana uses and that we, can, um, that we can learn from. So we've already said that Amazon prayer isn't real prayer. We can't just hand in a shopping list and expect it to be answers. Um, we can try through Chana's method to utilize what we've been given. But another focus of Chana's is, is Rav Dessler describes this other prayer method, the way that we are meant to pray and to know we will get a yes answer, right? The key to prayer he teaches is in what we ask for, right? So, so whenever I think of that, I'm, I'm reminded of a, um, it was actually a Shabbat morning and it had rained while we were in shul and we're walking home and everything is wet where we're going. And the kids are skipping ahead and everybody's kind of happy. We've had a nice kiddish pre-corona. And, and I look ahead and on the corner, it's actually, we lived on the woodlands and on the corner of woodlands and Golders Green Road, for some reason, whenever there was a heavy rain, there is a huge puddle. The entire, that entire corner is, is a huge puddle. So I called to my son who was skipping ahead and I, I screamed to him, I said, Shimon, watch the puddle. And sure enough, as he reached the puddle, he looked down and slowly walked through the puddle, watching the puddle the entire way. <laughs> right? So I realized we have to pay attention to our words to think about what we're really asking, right? What are we asking for? And to word it properly, okay? So um, Rav Dessler quotes a, um, a very famous verse from, um, from Tehillim. Um, it's Tehillim um, Kuf Memhe 145. It's Ashrei that we say um, actually twice a day, right? Ashrei, Ashrei, Vitecha, we say in Shacharit and also in Mincha. And in one of the verses, towards the end, we say, Karov Hashem lechol korav. Hashem is close to all those that call out to him. Lechol asher yikra'uhu be'emet. To all those that call out to him sincerely. Hashem is close to all those that call out to him. 
what does this mean? What happens? How does this work? Um, so I'd like to share this very beautiful, a little bit long, but very beautiful. And this is really the, the crux of what is happening here. Okay. Karov Hashem lechol korav. Hashem is close to all who call out him. Lechol asher yikro be'emet. All who call out him sincerely. Ve'kasher Hashem mitbarach, mitkarev el ha'kore elav. When Hashem, blessed be he, he comes close to the person who called out to him. Karov Hashem lechol korav. Hashem is close to everyone who calls out to him. In that place, says Rav Dessler, there is encounter. And he's basing this on Rav, Dessler's, Rav Hirsch's explanation, pgi'ah heinat fila. Pgi'ah means an encounter. And Rav Hirsch explains that whenever there's pgi'ah, an encounter, that's when, when there's real prayer. Zohi hidapkut. This is clinging or connecting to Hashem. Nimtza, we find. She'en hidapkut naset al yedei ha'adam levado. We find that connecting or clinging, dvekut, what is called, is not done by a person themselves. It's not the person themselves just, you know, shkups, suctions themselves onto Hashem, but rather, ela, shemilemala ba'im leumato, from above Hashem comes towards him, ad shenishlema ha until there is a complete encounter. Dvekut zo, this connection, this encounter, this connection is the answer that Hashem answers those that call out. I call out to Hashem, I want to be close to you. And Hashem is coming. It's not just that I go close to Hashem, it's that Hashem comes close to us. And he explains it with Dessler a little bit further. He says, I will explain. <laughs> Humans were created for the worship of Hashem. And their entire physical reality Our entire physical reality is only tools to use for spirituality. Ve'imken, therefore, gam tfilato ikar bakashato, also in prayer, our main request, the main request must only be for our spiritual purposes. Even worldly things that are requested, things in this world, physical things, we request it in order to aid us in serving Hashem. Ve'im can therefore, the content of prayer is only when a person's heart is requesting to come close to Hashem and to connect Him. And the closeness from above is the response. Everything we ask for, says Rav Dessler, is only things that we're asking to serve Hashem, to be close to Hashem. So my entire prayer is I would like to get close to Hashem and Hashem comes from above and connects with us. That is his response. You know, often I think I have it covered. I am capable. I am in control. Things are going well. And maybe I turn to God to ask for more. And sometimes it's not going so well. I'm not sure. I made half-hearted decisions. Maybe I turn to Hashem to ask for changes and maybe he solves the problem in the way I want it or maybe not, right? This is not guaranteed prayer. The Amazon prayer, the wish list is not prayer. There is no introspection in Amazon prayer. The guaranteed prayer is when I turn to Hashem and I say, my life is perfect. I need you to be part of it. I need to know that this is your connection with me. And Hashem says, here I am, I am with you. Or I turn to Hashem and I say, I'm confused. This is what I planned. I don't know what's happening. I need you to be part of this. I need to know that through all of this mess, you are with me. And Hashem says, here I am, I am with you, right? Rav Dessler's method of prayer is I ask Hashem to be close to me, 
to be part of everything I do? And then the answer is always yes. Hannah turns to Hashem and she says, there's no purpose to anything unless I can use it to be close to you, to feel that you are close to me. Everything we're given in life has a purpose. Everything we are not given in life has a purpose. And that purpose is always godliness. For me to bring Hashem into my life, to see him everywhere. You know, the, the Kotzka Rebbe, he was known for his wit. Right? Everything was, a, was a, a, a clever answer. And he asks and answers. He says, where can one find Hashem? Wherever we let him in. <sighs> Successful prayer is not about getting specific things. It's about figuring out how to use what I've been given. So I'll use health as an example. Right? I pray every morning, Rifa'en, God, please give me health. There are two options. Either he gives me health or he doesn't. The answer is yes or the answer is no. The main problem I see here is if the answer is yes and I'm healthy, then God cares about me and I'm happy with that. But if I'm not healthy because God said no, then it's easy to be angry with God and he's not in the picture because he said no to me. Right? But with this new paradigm of prayer, I dive in like this. Hashem, I want to be a spiritual person. I think the best way to connect, for me to connect to spirituality is with good health. I will have energy to take care of my family. I will run errands for the elderly woman across the street. I will bake a cake for my grandson's birthday. But Hashem, if you don't give me health, I recognize that sickness is the way I can connect with you. I'll have more compassion for anyone going through hardship. I will appreciate that every step is a gift. I will raise money for a charity that helps people with health issues, right? This kind of prayer is win-win because no matter what happens that day, I am a spiritual person and Hashem is there with me always. The same with wealth, right? I pray to Hashem, please give me financial means. I will spend it wise. I promise I will spend it wisely. Right? I will give charity. Um, I will invite lots of guests to see my new extension. <laughs> and if not, and I'm more poor, then I'll appreciate everything I do have. I will recognize even more the needs of those in my community. I will give in other ways right? Win, win. Hashem is there wherever you let him in. Amazon prayer. If it would work, you know, even if it would work, we run the risk of praying for the wrong thing and getting it, right? My husband's rabbi, Rabbi Wine, always, always says, he says, be careful of what you pray for because you might get it. You know, if I prayed and I, I got perfect health, but really I would have been better off sick because dealing with an illness would have prepared me for whatever difficulty I was going to have a few years later. And now I don't have that inner strength and that support system that I would have had, right? You know, King David famously, he prays for challenges right? He wants to prove to Hashem. He says, Hashem, I want to prove to you that I really am completely connected to you. Send me tests. That's the only way. When things are good, here I am. I'm the king. I'm happy. I got everything. It's all good. Whatever I want to eat, whatever I want to wear, whatever I want to see, whoever I want to see, right? That's easy. Of course, I'm going to be thankful. I sing all of these to him. I'm praising you, praising you, Ms. Morla David, right? I need challenges, when I have those challenges, I'm going to prove to you, right, that I'm on a high spiritual level and nothing can break that. And you know what happens? Hashem tests him and something breaks that, right? He fails. So even successful Amazon prayer is dangerous because what we're asking for, we don't really know if it's good in the long run or not really good in the long run. Rav Dessler's method is a 
win-win, right? God, I ask God, will you be with me? And I trust that what he sends me is perfect for me because he will be with me throughout. The answer, when we say to Hashem, will you be close to me? Be close to me. The answer is yes. Now, this really is a journey, right? It's not just hear it and great, we're there. You know, this is a constant purposeful exercise. Uh, in Hebrew, it's called avodah shebalev, right? It's work of the heart. It's, it's, hard, it's hard work, right? But, but this is why, maybe it's in a few months time, but Rosh Hashanah prayers are so full of God. God is king, God remembers everything, God is awesome, God is king, Hashem, 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 right? Because Rosh Hashanah is the day that like Chana, we recognize that life is all about seeing Hashem in every situation. And we read the story of Chana's prayer on Rosh Hashanah, the day that we are judged, judged for what the next year will bring. And it's the time to, to honestly focus and think like much like Chana. What do I dream of? So we turn to God and we say, right, God, you are king. Everything that we will be given, we ask for it so that we can be close to you, so we can see you close, so that we can connect, so that we can bring you, Hashem, into our lives, and we can share this spirituality with others. And all the things that I will be given, I will see Hashem there. And all of the things that I won't be given, I see Hashem there too. He's close to me there too. So that prayer, it calls out to Hashem from the true depths of our being. Hashem, everything I do is for your glory, a spiritual reality in a physical world. And when I open myself up to seeing him, then he is always close. The key to prayer is what we ask for. When we ask Hashem, please be a part of my life. Be close to me. I want to sense you. The answer is always yes. Hashem is always close. <laughs> That, that's, that's the goal, you know, we, for, for, for all these months, this year almost, the shuls were, were closed. And it really, you know, for me, it gave me a lot of time to really think what prayer should be, you know, private individual prayer, right? And, and I think it's actually interesting that, that the best parts of shul are often the communal parts, right? We're singing together, we're, we're davening together. And, and I think we really, we need to figure out a way to amalgamate these two things, to, to use, now that we're going back to shul, right? To use, you know, the, this group prayer, this public prayer to, to feel like we're part of something great, that we can achieve amazing things because we're, we're always, we're even bigger than the sum of our parts, right? But at the same time, to really be able to have a real, private prayer, to take that our own personal space um, with the tools, again, that Chana gave us, right? Where with our eyes, with our mouth, with our, with our whole bodies, um, to, to, really, to, to, to really express how we want to connect to Hashem, that we really want that spiritual element in our lives. And, and I really believe that, that the more we ask for it, the more the answer will always be yes. Thank you so much. Does anyone have any questions? Any comments? Okay, so while well, I thank you, people can... can can think up their questions. So thank you for such lively and charismatic examination of Tefillah and really giving us such poignant and meaningful lessons that we can incorporate into our own lives. So huge thanks. Next week, Rabbanit Shani Tarragon will be speaking on 
FOMO, fear of missing out in a POMO, postmodern society. If anyone wants to make a dedication for any week, please let me know on Amy Landy know. Uh, we look forward to seeing you next Sunday evening at 8.30. And if anyone wants to unmute themselves, you can see all the thanks in the chat. Everyone's found it really meaningful. Mm. Anyone want to unmute or ask a question in the chat? Okay, so we will round up. And thank you for giving us of your time and your energy and your enthusiasm. Pleasure, pleasure. Thank you everyone for joining. All right, good night everyone. Thank you again. Bye.